uh, the latest instalment in Field Fisher's uh, GDPR practical webinar series. Um, my name's Alden Takitumu. I'm a senior associate here in the uh, Silicon Valley office. Uh, today, uh, I am joined in the studio by um, my, Mr. Mark Weber, uh, who is the, the US managing partner, um, and by uh, Anna Gasso, who is uh, our resident, uh, one of our privacy team here, and uh, both French and US uh, qualified and our, our resident expert on CCPA, um, amongst other things. Hello. And hello, everybody. Um, so for those of you who haven't dialed into one of these before, um, as I say, this is the, the fifth or sixth one we've done. Um, you know, please, please do check out uh, the other ones uh, that we, we like to keep things pretty pretty informal so um, I have the easy job today of uh, leading and asking the questions of our two experts here uh, today um, and the topic is obviously outbound lead uh, generation uh, very much a hot topic amongst lots of our lots of our clients um, we're here to to reassure you that you you very much still, can do outbound lead generation in Europe. Um, you know, all, all of those things, buying and lists of contact data, social media scraping, uh, all of that stuff is still is still legal in GDPR land, uh, but it it has got a little bit tougher. And we're going to talk to you about um, those various um, compliance hoops that you might need to to, to jump through. Um, so I think on the screen you can see. Um, probably the six biggest questions that we get in this in this topic area is it still okay to use public sources can we rely on third-party data um, you know what legal basis do we rely on is there can we rely on both consent and or legitimate interest or a little bit of both um, how do we comply with our transparency obligations how do we structure our uh, our marketing program to make sure that we're we're minimizing um, risk and then um, you know how do we make sure that we protect ourselves in our contracts um, and then if we if we get time um, we will uh, we will try to, to cover in a couple of minutes where we are on the um, the e-privacy regulation um, which spoiler alert we're not that far much far further forward than we were um, two or three years ago when we were doing webinars about uh, the e-privacy regulation. So um, if, I, if I sort of start at the basics and we, we set the scene. Um, so when, we, when we're talking about your, your marketing program or your, your outbound lead generation, there's really two key sets of, of European laws in play. Um, so you should be seeing in front of you a a Venn diagram. Um, you know, we, we like to include a Venn to keep all of our consultant friends happy. Um, <laughs> but there, there are very much two laws in play uh, when we when we talk about direct marketing. So there's the the GDPR, which um, you know, no doubt everyone's heard about. That's you know, the GDPR is is the the broad um, broadly applying law that applies to all personal data processing. So obviously with with any form of direct marketing, there, there's likely to be personal data processing involved. So you're gonna have all of those um, obligations to deal with under the GDPR. Um, and then the other, the other part of the VEN is uh, e-privacy laws. So just in, in terms of the e-privacy laws, so that's, um, is an e-privacy directive and then various uh, national laws that implement that directive throughout throughout Europe and the the where where e-privacy really bites on uh, your marketing program is really at either end of the of, of the scale so uh, firstly I'll start at the back end you, you under e-privacy law you have to have um, consent to to send marketing mails to to individuals or, or any electronic marketing communication, whether that's 
uh, email or or text message. Um, we'll we'll talk a bit a little bit later about what about the standard of that of that consent. And then the other the other way that e-privacy law plays into your marketing program these days is at the front end um, collection. So no doubt you've all heard of the of the cookie law. Um, no doubt you've all been on uh, European websites and you know had that cookie banner interrupt your day. Um, that that cookie banner banner comes out of e privacy law, uh, which says that the the automatic retrieval of of data or storing of data on a, on an individual's device and that's any data um, must be must be with that with that individual's um, consent. Um, so I think that's that's where we are in terms of setting the scene. Um, obviously, this I mean, forgive us, we're having some dramas with the slides, <laughs> but um, yeah, like like I sort of alluded to at the start, this this area of law is is very much a, a hot topic. Um, you know, we've seen lots of lots of challenges from from privacy advocacy groups and complaints from individuals around around this area um, of law and you know we think very much that it's going to be um, a continued area of focus for uh, for for European regulators so it is it is important that we we get those things right um, and so I think probably the the logical uh, place to start is 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 legal basis um, or ensuring that you can lawfully process any any personal data. So on on that one, I'll hand over to Anna. Thank you, Anna. Anna, how how do we ensure that we have a legal basis? Correct. I think a lot of um, organizations are confused by the fact that they need to get consent for a privacy purpose, and so they believe that they need to rely on consent as a legal basis, or at least they confuse that requirement for consent under the e-privacy directive and the requirement for a legal basis under the GDPR. And, and that's true, that is quite confusing. Um, but while you need to have a legal basis to process um, personal information for direct marketing, uh, it doesn't mean that you need to rely on consent. Consent is one of the legal bases um, that are available under the GDPR. Um, another one is the legitimate interest. Mm -hmm. And um, direct marketing, for direct marketing, you can rely on legitimate interest, but there is just some risk in relying on legitimate interest when you need to get consent for a privacy purpose. Um, and the reason why it's it's not that there are some risk, but it might become confusing, it's because um, some regulators don't really like the idea of um, getting consent for e-privacy directive and then relying on legitimate interest because it might confuse uh, your customer or your users if you need to get up consent and then but you tell them that you're actually really relying on your legitimate interest or you don't really tell them but that's that's your um that's your analysis um so i think it's it's not a, it's kind of where the issue is for a lot of our clients and is it's quite confusing mm -hmm. Um, it's not clear. I think the issue is not that as important if you're doing only B2B um, direct marketing because in countries like the UK and France, you don't really need opt-in consent. So in that case, it's really easy to uh, build your argument and say that you rely on legitimate interest because you do not collect consent anyway. Um, it might be a little bit more complicated in countries where you need to get opt-in consent regardless of whether you are uh, sending the marketing communication to a um, consumer email address or a business email address. Yeah. So, I think, so what, what you're, if I can play that back to you, so what you're saying there is that within that, that overall framework of saying that you have a legitimate interest to, to undertake marketing, direct marketing, Within that framework, you can have a specific consent for the collection of any device data, and then another specific consent for the sending of the electronic mail itself. Yeah. Okay. And I think the thing that's possibly worth throwing in here at this part of the debate is another thing which confuses 
is the beginning of this discussion, we focused on the data controller that's actually thinking about sending the marketing emails. But in many times when we're dealing with lead gen, there's a provider of those lead gen email services. And then there's the ultimate recipient, the controller that's going to use those emails to market for their own purposes. And in that scenario, we've actually got two controllers um, and there's a controller to controller exchange. Um, from the lead gen provider to the party that's sending the email. But then also, because we've got two providers, there's actually two assess uh, sorry, two controllers. There's also an assessment that needs to be made by the lead gen provider because they're building a database and collecting information. They're processing person information. So they have to ensure they've got lawful grounds and establish a legal basis. Um, then when that's provided to the third party that is actually going to be the controller sending out the email marketing, they have to establish their own legal grounds. And it is them which is dealing with both GDPR and with e-privacy. Mm -hmm. And this is where we see some confusion in the market because it's quite easy for a lead gen provider to collect the data. They have a relationship in many situations with the data subject they're collecting that data from. And because they're just passing the data on, they only need to consider about their lawful grounds and the legal basis under the GDPR. So it's easy for them to talk about um, how it's been collected in accordance with GDPR and establish their lawful grounds. The complication comes, as we'll see, when they want to send the emails from the second controller. That second controller hasn't had the relationship with the data subject, but also um, to Eldon's Venn diagram at the beginning, they're wrestling with lawful grounds under GDPR, but also the grounds uh, or permissions for sending that email marketing message under the uh, e-privacy rules. And there's a little bit of difference there. And you know, to be fair, there's a little bit of confusion in the marketplace because the way some of the lead gen providers have positioned themselves, it suits them to talk only about GDPR and focus in on that. Um, and uh, what their commentary and their explanations of compliance often admit to discuss is the grounds that the controller sending that email marketing message need to assess in, in relation to e-privacy. And that, yeah, that's another element of this confusion that we're talking through. So, so just to, to play devil's advocate, could, can one of you talk about perhaps what the, what the drawbacks would be or, or, the, or the pros and cons say of um, if, you, if you are that second controller and that data has been collected by a lead gen provider on the basis of consent, can, can you talk us through why you wouldn't just rely on consent all the way through as your as your legal basis? I think because consent is tricky, um, it's hard to get valid consent, um, especially under the GDPR. Um, and because consent needs to be free, freely given, so it means you cannot bundle it. Um, it can be a condition to access uh, a document or an event. It needs to be specific, so um, it needs to name you. Um, if, if the first party is collecting the consent, they need to name you and specifically say in their consent that they, they, they're gonna um, share the contact details with you and you will send marketing communication. And if you wanna be on the safe side, it should also name the, the, the method of communication that you will use to communicate with that individual. Um, uh, it has to be an ambiguous, so it means that it can't be um, pre-check box, it has to be um, unchecked opt-in boxes. So it's a little bit tricky and it has to be informed, of course, and, and, and that's an issue because it means mm -hmm. that not only the first party has to provide information about the way they're going to process the data, but you will also have to, to provide information about that. Um, and it can be withdrawn at any time. So that's um, a little bit complicated. Yeah. And, and there, therein lies some of the issue for the lead gen providers, because uh, obviously prior to GDPR um, there was, and, and today, there's a, there's a real incentive to build databases um, have potential names and then to use those databases to effectively sell them on to others. Now, if you don't know who your future customer is, you can't be specific about that customer. Um, so it's much harder to build a consent for that customer because they've never been named. They may have been referred to in a general category sense around partners or others that we send messages to, but there are real challenges as Anna's pointing out to consent in that scenario. 
Um, there are lead gen providers now that are going out to the market and, and building databases specifically for a controller customer. And in that situation, if the mandate is to go and build a database, um, then you can be more specific because you know who you're building that database for and you can overcome some of those um, sort of information challenges that might otherwise be there. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real kind of you know, difficulty and, um, and it's, it's easy to sort of assume they have the right to build the database, but the controller that's receiving the information from that lead gen provider also needs to make its own um, uh, assessments. And that's, yeah, that's what we're wrestling with here, Eldon. So. Yeah, and I think that's, a, that's, you talked about information challenges there, Mark. Um, it's probably a good segue to talk about um, transparency now. Um, you know, obviously transparency is a word, a word that we, um, we hear about a lot. Um, you know, I think, the Keneal used the French word for it about 400 times in their, uh, in their Google yeah. um, ruling. Um, yeah, so, so Mark, talk, talk us through what, what the transparency uh, obligations are and, and how, how the, the various players in this market yeah. should be discharging. Yeah, yeah thank you. And, and, and in part, this is why I was making a distinction earlier, because there's two parties to this transaction the party building the database is the lead gen provider and then the controller that wants to take those emails and share them out. And obviously they're both acting as controller, they're both acting as independent controllers. Um, so they're both obtaining and processing personal data, one with the outcome of you know, building its business as a lead gen provider and the other with you know, building its own database so it can send emails out to its customers or potential customers in, in this instance. So processing personal data, as Anna has talked about, we need lawful grounds, but we also need to overcome the transparency hurdle because in order to have fair and lawful processing, we need grounds and we need transparency. So then you need to think about that transparency and particularly get into the, the type of model um, and the, the transparency is going to depend on the source of that information to a degree. So if we look at the lead gen provider to start with, they have obligations under the GDPR uh, and they have to be transparent. And we've talked about the grounds. So their transparency, they're obtaining information directly from the data subject in many circumstances, although some models will see them partnering with others. But the party that's obtaining the information directly from the data subject is going to have obligations under Article 13. So the typical Article 13 transparency obligations, that long list of information that has to be provided, typically provided by way of privacy policy, but should be provided in clear, comprehensive language at the time that information is collected. And, it, and it's relatively easy to think about Article 13 because there is a touch point with that, con, uh, that data subject at the point the information is collected. Sometimes this model then comes under some challenge because where you're the third party relying on the lead gen provider, um, or you're the third party scraping data from social media, and other sources and we should say that scraping should always be assessed in terms of contractual rights to do that scraping whether you're licensed and permitted to so um, we're going to park that for the moment to, uh, in terms of scraping but it's, let's assume it's lawful scraping um, that in those certain circumstances the control of sending out the marketing email hasn't had a relationship with the data subject or they've scraped it from a, a, a third party website. And in those scenarios, Article 13 doesn't apply because it hasn't directly obtained information, personal information from the data subject. In fact, Article 14 applies. And that's a, a, an article which is often forgotten. Um, and Article 14 applies where uh, it, personal data is obtained from the data subject and that data has not been obtained directly from the data subject. So um, the, here, herein lies the challenge. If you're scraping data, um, you're adding data to a database, you've then got to inform the individuals. Um, and if you're obtaining that data from a lead gen provider, building it into your own uh, database to, before you send out those emails to prospective customers, you've also got to inform those uh, end users that, uh, or those data subjects that you're processing their information. And that means getting all of the information in Article 14 to those individuals unless an exemption applies. 
And yeah, you know, there's a challenge because you don't have a relationship. So uh, simply, um, Article 14 requires all of the information that you had to provide under Article 13, the notice about who you are, the purposes for which you're using information, your DPO, the fact that they've got rights. So it's not something that's easily uh, presented to individuals. But um, you know, it's simply put, Article 14 says that information has to be provided um, uh, in within one month of obtaining the information, or at least at the first time that information is used, if it's used within within that month. And the exemptions say, unless that data subject has already got that information. So in some business models of lead gen, you may be able to rely on that third party lead gen provider to providing sufficient information about your use and purposes and the fact that they are sourcing the information. But that's often difficult to, to, to do. Um, there are some... That's, just just sorry, on yeah, that point, Mark, yeah. um, that's something that some, some of the regulators hate. Yeah, we, yeah mean, let's talk the about... Recent, the recent yeah. guidance so. from the CNIL says that even... I mean, it doesn't mention the fact that the first party might provide information. I mean, it requires the first party to provide information, but it also requires the third party that received the personal data from direct marketing purpose to provide some information, regardless of the information that had been provided by the first party. And in that case, it means that you have to, in your first communication, the first marketing email that you're gonna to send to uh, the individual, you have to tell that individual how you obtain the data. So the source, yeah, the who, source. Gave, who gave you the data. And even if the first party provided some information, you still have to provide that information. Yeah. And, and, and that's why I said, unless they provided the source. And this is the yeah. difference. If, if you read Article 13 and 14, uh, if you're so inclined, you'll see they pretty much look the same. But the, the real killer is Article 14.2F, which talks about providing the source of the personal data from which it, it originates, um, or if applicable, whether it came from publicly accessible sources, which is the notice that you've been scraping it or, or building it in other ways. So all, essentially, as a Third, uh, as a controller, you're an independent controller looking to compile a database to send marketing messages. And you're dealing with your own lawful grounds and your own transparency under Article 14. And this is a challenge because it effectively means as data is coming in and you're assembling that database, either you've got an opportunity to tell the individuals because you're going to market to them and you should mark, do that within the month as a part of that marketing communication. Or if you're assembling that database to use over time, that independent controller that's contemplating marketing has to go out to those individuals and let them know that they're compiling a database. Now, there is an exemption under Article 14.2, which effectively says that um, you don't have to go out if it proves impossible or would involve disproportionate effort. Now, I think we'd argue if you were um, building a marketing database, you have their emails, you have their contacts. It's hard to say it's impossible or it's disproportionate effort. Yes, it's a pain. Yes, it takes time. But the whole point of the GDPR is ensuring that data subjects whose information is being processed are being notified about that processing, the purpose of that processing, and then ultimately being given some kind of chance to understand their rights and yeah, potentially to object. So I don't think that you can rely on exemptions in this scenario. And you have to start thinking about that Article 14 notice. And in fact, just in our office and with a couple of our London crew and the, the famous Phil Lee, there was a bit of excitement um, before Christmas as we started to see our own um, notice, you know, notices coming in under Article 14 from certain providers as we were being added as Field Fisher um, partners and lawyers to databases. So there are businesses out there sending Article 14 notices. They're not all fully compliant because they rarely reference the source, um, but we are seeing that starting to happen as 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 the law would require. But it's it's a real burden when you're talking to your marketing teams about this because they're building 200,000 names in a database, and you say, oh well, you've got to go out to them and tell them that we're processing the information, and you want to minimise the number of notices you want to you know use that to, to hit them and, and often that's going to then trigger please delete my information or a data subject access request or some kind of deletion request so those kind of interactions make this kind of lead gen model difficult unless you're really ready and i think our best advice in this scenario is if you're going to have the data coming in and it's coming in indirectly make sure you're using that data and having an opportunity to interact and communicate with the data subject 
uh, within the month uh, of that information uh, mm -hmm. being obtained and don't sit back and forget mm -hmm. about providing the information and yeah you know, it could be a you know it could be a partial layered notice with information about purposes and then linking off mm -hmm. but it needs to be conspicuous enough that it's really bringing notice to those individuals because they have no other information about you what you're intending to use them information for and, and what their rights are etc so so uh, it sounds to me that you're you're suggesting there that it it needs to be something more than just sending that first marketing communication with a link to the privacy privacy notice. I, I mean, I think, yeah, this is where your risk based approach comes in. I mean, I think if you you could combine it in that first marketing notice, but it has to be conspicuous enough that it's not buried at the bottom of the message. I mean, let's face it. I mean, you could find challenge for that. I mean, many people, you know, you should identify a marketing message on the face of the message. Many of us will see it, delete it and never get any notice. Um, so burying it, it it's it isn't recommended if you are going to use that first marketing communication then yes you should others have taken the more pure probably more defensible approach of sending a separate communication around the processing and the fact they're held in that information but of course from a marketing perspective which is why i say this needs to be risk-based you know do you really want to be engaging with businesses before you they even know who you are what you're trying to do because that prompts other things and we have found um, that that's just the sort of thing that brings you into data subject rights requests and deletions and, uh, and and other burdens in terms of supporting those rights. But it's one of those things you need to weigh up around obtaining these third party marketing lists. And I, I think it's one of the things that's also difficult to communicate to marketing teams because marketing teams, you know, have their best yeah their own best interests at heart they're very experienced in what they do but they have a good idea of what others are doing and it's mm. always peer benchmarking and we don't necessarily see others doing this uh, across the board in the market they also know what they've always done and of course gdpr has changed some of that so convincing and working with teams to do this in a different way and then to anna's point also convincing and working with teams to think that you might need to do different things for different markets is also different. So that jurisdictional difference, I think we've seen for a while businesses, you know, making adaptions for Canada because Canada came in with fairly strict laws for Castle, but there are also, yeah, other issues on, on a global nature. And we can kind of come on to that and uh, and talk to that. And I, and I think this was uh, something, Anna, you were going to speak to. Or I think, <laughs> or all of yeah, us. I think yeah, we're all going to talk about that. Um, yeah. But yeah, but I think as as you said, Mark, probably that that first point is is deciding what approach you're going to take to your to your marketing program. Like like we mentioned briefly at the start, there are different rules um, in in every in every country. Um, so you know, but you you can either take a country by country approach, which I'd say is I mean, very rare, but it, it can, works can work. if you have if it works if you are a, a big organization and you have the means to do that to go country by country. You have strong marketing and legal team in each country, so it makes sense to do that. But it's like you said, it it, it doesn't make sense if it's not the case. Mm. It's it's also what when you look at historic databases, often people have collected email address but don't necessarily know where that individual is based as well so going country by country you either bring yourself up to the highest benchmark of law which is effectively opt-in and if you've already got that data and you can't evidence that opt-in you can't evidence that consent so you probably haven't got opt-in um, so you're looking at different uh, different approaches and it, it is difficult and this is one of the things we saw through gdpr that historic database where collection hadn't been as strict um, some took the, the decision to you know, remove it. Some took the decision to reconsent. There was probably too much, or well, certainly too much, reconsenting going on. But really understanding the data and understanding it's it's it, it, you know where it's from and supplementing it is different difficult. And, and this is where, particularly on a global basis, um, a number of our clients work with email platform providers that are able to sort of segment, list, manage suppression lists, manage opt-ins and sort of work on better email marketing. So those that are you know rich enough and large enough to implement those platforms are probably at an advantage here because it does give you know a, a framework um, operationally to, to bring in some compliance. But you do have to have those discussions about where you're sending marketing, the kind of marketing, um, and then the type of marketing that you send. Uh, one of the things, I mean, obviously we're, we're talking a lot about sending the message, but there's a whole lot of law out there about the messages that are within the marketing around advertising, brand, IP risks, 
um, confidentiality, etc. So you will need to be uh, aware of the, the content of that message. There are also other laws in Europe, like the e-commerce directive, which kind of sneaks in, which talks about having a opt-out rule, um, uh, an opt-out within every message. So there's an ability to opt out of the communication. It should be clear from the face of the communication that it's a marketing message and also under e-commerce rules because it's a communication you may have additional obligations around disclosure um, the fact that you have to disclose the entity that's sending the marketing message something to think about if you're using a third party canon or sending tool to make sure they're not branding it as theirs uh, identifying your corporation um, and contact points but then also in certain countries looking at um, local obligations if it's a um, UK entity, it's a communication from a UK entity, and there are other rules around you know, identification of that entity to include things like um, company registered number, etc. So there's an overlapping of GDPR, of e-privacy, of the e-commerce directive, of other national statutes around marketing and uh, sort of misrepresentation and stuff. So, so suddenly something you know legislatively looks um, you know quite difficult to decipher. But then also some of our clients and some of you out there on the call will be um, signed up to Direct Marketing Association, which will have its own rules, or there'll mm -hmm. be local marketing codes and other things to consider. So um, when you look at all of this, it often becomes yeah, too too difficult to look at on a specific country by country basis. So it's either prioritization, minimizing marketing in certain areas, or bringing yourself up to a higher benchmark, depending on where your risk is. Um, you know, some will you know, will look at well, as long as I've got an unsubscribe and I never market to them again, maybe I'll get away with it. But of course, that's not marketing within the law. That's definitely a risk based decision to be you know weighing up quite carefully. And I think it's the same thing depending on if you do. B2C, so business to consumer, or if you do B2B, because in the, the risks are, are much lower in a B2B context in many European countries. It's not the case in some EU countries, some like Germany, but in many countries, such as the UK, it's not even regulated mm -hmm. under the e-privacy directive, at least. So the risks are much lower and people tend to complain less. Yeah. when they receive mm -hmm. marketing communication to their business email address than when they receive those communication of their personal email address. Yeah, and just like in terms of that that risk, um, I, I know social media or, or public scraping has come up um, a couple of times. Um, in a B2B context, am I right to assume that if we are only scraping data from, say, Mark Webber, US managing partner's public profile, that's probably going to be a lower risk than, you know, more invasive data scraping techniques. Potentially. I mean, there are some technical arguments in the UK as a, a member of a UK partnership, whether that UK partnership is an LLP or a real partnership or a Scottish partnership yeah. and the way it's treated under law, because it's not always B2B marketing. Some of those situations would be seen as B2C, B2C. because individual partners uh, may be seen as individual individuals so, um, in, in their own right and therefore it would be consumer marketing. But uh, I mean, that's a, kind of a pedantic legalistic point, but it's there so under the law. Imagine the so, same question if you were uh, Mark Webber, CEO. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 one day. More, yeah. One day when I'm CEO, I will, I mean, to, to some extent, you know, some will see themselves as fair game. And I think business to business marketing is, is more tolerated. And there's less of, uh, to Anna's point, less of an emphasis from the regulators right now around the regulation. But it doesn't mean there isn't law there. Mm -hmm. um, I think the important thing is where we see uh, clients getting caught out is um, it's very easy to confuse service messages around your service and marketing messages. Service messages themselves aren't regulated in the same way. You can still send them. If you start blurring marketing messages with your service messages, you tip the balance into marketing. But that's one area to to, to look out for um, and making sure that you you know you preserve your rights to have a service message you don't need to have an opt-out in a service message for example you have to tell people there's downtime between 2 a.m and 4 a.m on the SaaS service they're using um, so yeah make, making distinctions around the kind of message you're, you're making uh, I think is is important and then then really uh, because there's an obligation and because it protects you having that unsubscribe in every message 
making sure that unsubscribe link actually works and is registered. Uh, uh, but then importantly, with that unsubscribe, you should be maintaining a suppression list. If Anna has said, please don't market to me again, the worst thing you can do is market to Anna again. And then you know, that comes, you know, becomes a very difficult issue if you've got siloed business units or different business groups or different group companies marketing, because you, know, you may find the English business is sending out uh, updates and the US send something else different. They don't compare suppression lists. And you know, although the English entity is, my, is, is, is tracking unsubscribes, they're not in the US. And yes, there are differences between companies and group to group, but you really need to be you know, thinking about that and managing that and, and really making sure you don't trip yourself up because that's where you're likely to draw complaint or you know, potentially in investigation um, because somebody's expressed their right not to be marketed to. That's an absolute right under the GDPR in any event, regardless of any of the other rules. And uh, you really need to be making sure you can honor that and, and keep to honoring that um, and, and, and kind of working that through. So, um. Cool. Um, so, so we've heard it sounds like if you can afford a good email a good platform to manage your your opt-outs and your suppression list you should be doing that um it sounds like we should be telling our marketing teams um you know, to, to think about the messages they're they're sending um any any other tips in terms of good good marketing hygiene um i think we can move to maybe the pre-contract DD. yeah i think perfect <laughs> Uh, I think one of the most important thing here is that you need to know your vendor. So mm -hmm. you need to know which service provider you're going to use and whether they're going to collect and, and the data appropriately, what notice they're going to provide, how they're going to get consent if they need to, to get consent, what language they're going to provide when they're going to get consent. Um, so you really have to conduct a proper due diligence um, when you're, you're looking at a lead generation provider. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not enough if they just tell you that they are GDPR compliant. It's not enough if they just tell you that they are e-privacy compliant. Uh, you mm -hmm. have to really understand how they work. What are the sources? Mm -hmm. How do they collect the data? What do they tell the individual when they do that? And so it, it's... And, and, I'm, and that need for, for pre-contract due diligence, um, that's something that, that people should be communicating to their marketing teams because, I mean, so often deals we work on, like the the marketing guys want to go with the campaign like yesterday. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. so setting that expectation with your marketing teams, then it's it's not as easy as it used to be to just buy in a list and, you know, start spamming. Well, start sending targeted <laughs> marketing Don't uh, use spamming. Mails. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah uh, I, I think you have to train them and ideally you need to find someone in the marketing team that's going to be uh, like a champion or an, exactly or an a privacy champion it's going to know about how to choose vendor and what should be in, in the contract and and that type of information. Yeah, and then managing that database when it's onboarded, yeah. tagging where it's come from. We, we often find at the point of DSAR, um, we get pushed by some saying, oh, well, where did you get this information from? And then you're like, well, you know, unless you yeah. tracked that in and you can find out which list it came on and then you can evidence that, um, you've got your own, uh, your own issues being drawn out through data subject access rights, et cetera. So you can yeah, completely agree that, yeah, it's a, it's a process and a management thing, um, but that process and management needs to be with, with regard to the legal framework you're trying to work to. So uh, you mentioned earlier, Mark, that it's, you know, typically these, these relationships are controller to controller relationships between the, you know, the data broker or the acquirer and the, and the second controller. Um, what does that mean from a from a contracting perspective? Obviously, yeah. we don't have the handy Article Twenty Eight. That's terms. right. That's um, right. So, you, I mean, occasionally these third party lead gen providers may be acting for you to gather information. That's pretty rare. Yeah. I think we should assume that it's a controller to controller. These parties aren't working as joint controllers because they're both pursuing their own separate business purposes. So, Article Twenty Six doesn't apply. Um, so, actually, the GDPR doesn't say anything about having terms. However, commercially, there are definitely terms that you, you'd want to put in place. And I think this is partly goes to the message I've put in uh, around, you know, it's easy for that lead gen provider to be GDPR compliant and they can warrant their GDPR compliant. But you 
as the party sending the emails have your own compliance obligations. So just getting a warranty about compliance is 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 one thing, but you need to be you know thinking about how they can help you um, provide information. Um, but it, but also you know getting assurances around the kind of consents that they'll put in place if they are relying on consent. Um, ensuring that they have proper notices in place and vetting that. Um, but then also, you know, looking at are they, you know, they have, they effectively, you know, operating and, you know, partly doing that due diligence, but then partly thinking about the sort of the what if. So around their own compliance and holding to that, them to that compliance um, cont contractually, but then also thinking about risk and liability and indemnity. Mm -hmm. One of the things, I mean, a lot of these transactions, the reason they tend to get missed at a legal level is they're, they're, they're relatively small transactions. You can buy in a list for a couple of thousand dollars. It might fall below the threshold. Somebody can do it on their own credit card. But that really means the, the, own, uh, the, yeah, the terms and conditions are likely to be standard terms and conditions of the vendor they probably limit their liability and you know we've seen list marketing providers you know, limiting you know to a hundred dollars or to the cost of the list provided now your own liability as a lead gen provide uh, as, as a um as a user of that information is probably far greater um you're probably not going to win that much around you know liability and indemnity you might if you're setting up a large relationship so it really comes down to protecting yourself in other ways understanding that vendor understanding their attitude some of the good vendors out there have got faqs they've got descriptions they can explain all of these things and if um, they can hit you with some pdfs and those uh, and information and faqs about how they're in compliance that's great, but I think you also need to be thinking, well, that shows they're in compliance, but what did the I then have to do around compliance? Mm. And while the contract might make you feel better, it probably really isn't the tool that's gonna to help you because if you get into hot water around this kind of marketing, you're gonna be dealing with regulators, it's gonna be backwards and forwards, you're gonna be dealing with disgruntled data subjects. Contract doesn't really help you there. You're unlikely to be able to claim back on that. You, you may if you've got a very wide contract, but really it's a, administrative and a sort of compliance burden for your own business so needing to think about you know how many of these lists do we buy in how do we manage them are we going to manage these other alternatives um you know ways to market or or, or just kind of you know you know, cutting down on, on on how these these this list are used and then you know making sure you've got you know where it is possible sufficient contractual terms and you've thought about that away from standard gdpr compliance so. and and with with some of the more sophisticated lead gen models that you know sometimes we'll, we'll we'll have your database hooked up with a provider's database all the time uh, how, how do you do you recommend having audits or how do you manage that ongoing sort of contractual due diligence compliance relationship yeah i think audit rights is definitely a good idea Mm -hmm. um, they should be able to give you um, the proof of consent because mm -hmm. you need to retain them because if you have a regulator that comes to you, you need to be able to prove that you got consent if you need to get consent. Um, and um, yeah, I, th I think audits is definitely a good idea. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, and, and within that audit going into, you know, what are you doing? Have you changed the way you're obtaining that information? And, you know, there are definitely lead gen models, Eldon, that get more complicated in that you may be buying emails from one provider. You may be providing, e buying email matches from another provider and uh, enhancing profiles and building profiles of individuals and uh, in doing more sophisticated stuff. And I think that's a, probably a topic for another day. But if you are merging databases and relying on multiple providers to, to build a, you know, profile or a more in-depth um, intelligence about individuals. There are other considerations, not least around your own legal basis and how you're doing that, as, as well as, of course, the, the age-old issue of transparency. So, Okay. Well, I think I've got the, the producer in my ear telling us to wrap up that we're at the top of the um, our allotted time. Um, we will... We will release the recording thanks for thanks for dialing in we we hope it's been helpful um i'm not sure if the it will will answer any questions that we've had um online and in, in writing and send it out to everyone and um look out for the next installment on the Phil fisher series which is on a very interesting topic. Sure. <laughs> sure. We're, all, we're all scratching our heads on to remember. But uh, yeah, watch out for an email soon. Um, um, also, for those of you who are listening, and we know there are an increasing number, if there are topics you would like to hear, 
about or talked about in more depth, then yeah, feel free to drop us a mail and suggest them. We're always happy to do this, but this is going to be a regular series. And if there's enough interest, we're more than happy to to, to look at uh, other things. So, and we're doing yeah. podcasts now as well. So we oh, just yeah. released a podcast on the um, CNIL decision, on the CNIL versus Google decision. Yeah. Yeah, and by registering for this webinar, you've consented to us <laughs> sending you marketing mails. Um, and on that note, thanks everyone. We will hear from you soon. Thank Cheers. you. Bye.